1776, 4th of July. When I mention that date to you, I bet two things come to your mind. I can almost guarantee it. Declaration of Independence and July 4th. Those are two important items in our country. Declaration of Independence is a document, July 4th is a date, and those things, both of those things point to one thing, freedom. And Americans love freedom. I love my freedom, don't mess with my freedom. I like my freedom. Today the message is entitled, Given, Governed, and Guided. We're gonna study a a passage out of Galatians chapter 5, and it's about what to do with our freedom. And then we're going to look at how the, what the Bible says about what to do with our freedom, and then what our founding fathers had to say about what we should do with our freedoms. And I believe that the founding fathers used the principles found in the passage that we're going to look at today to build an entire constitution, an entire country around those principles. I also want to find out what is so powerful in this passage that people would be willing to give up their possessions. People would be willing to give up their status, their family, and eventually their lives. What's so powerful in these verses that would make somebody do that? If, if you're in the military, if you've been in the military, just raise your hand. You understand more than anybody. They were willing to risk their life so we could be here. That's, that's America. That's the America that I love. But, and that's the America our founding fathers started. But what was it in this passage that made them be willing to do that? What principles do our military people know that we don't, that made them willing to risk their lives for my freedom? Famous founder, Patrick Henry, once famously said, give me liberty or give me death. We all know that. Paul, in the Bible, was also willing to risk his life for this passage. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's going to tell us a little bit about what he was willing to endure. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll be reading verses 24 through 27. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. And if you remember several weeks ago, Pastor Jerry was talking about that and how he explained that 39, 40 minus one, is really not the number of times that they whipped you. It meant one more would kill you. Up to the point where we won't kill you. He was whipped five times where if he got one more, it would. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbery, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, sleepness, sleeplessness often and hunger and thirst, and fasting often, and cold and nakedness. What would it be that would motivate Paul or anybody else to go through all that? Why would anybody do that? What would cause them to do that? When our founding fathers decided to do this, they risked their life and limb by signing their name to the Declaration of Independence. That were, they were signing their own death warrant. If they were caught, they would have been executed. But they decided to do this grand experiment. And when they decided to make this country, they honestly, they didn't know a lot about what they wanted, but they knew about what they didn't want. They didn't want tyranny. They didn't want taxes without representation. They didn't want an overseas landlord telling us what we could and could not do. But they did know one thing that they wanted, and they wanted freedom. Paul, the Bible, and the Founding Fathers all understand what this freedom and where this freedom comes from and what it represents. So turn with me in Genesis, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to read the verses that I've been talking about. 
Galatians chapter 5. Verses 13 through 15. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. I'll be honest, when I started studying this, my, I was a little disappointed. I'm like, that's it? That's the, that's the whole verse? That's the whole passage? That's what people are willing to die for? What am I missing? Well, it, finds, it turns out that I was missing quite a bit. What we're going to find out in this passage is that we were given freedom, that our freedom is governed by love, and that our freedom is guided by wisdom. Those are the three principles that I believe the Founding Fathers used and the three principles that we're going to see in the Bible today. So according to that verse, what's the first thing that we were given? We were given freedom. And that's our first principle. Real freedom is given by God. Now we're in a time in our country where a lot of people look to the government to give them freedoms. The government does not give us freedom. Only God gives us freedom. And our founders knew that if we give away our freedoms to the government, we're never getting them back. So we need to be careful of what we're willing to give up to the government. They understood the government is not your friends. It's necessary, but they're not our friends. I think it was Ronald Reagan who said the scariest thing in the world is when somebody knocks on your door and says, I'm, a, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Scary phone call. John uh, chapter 8, verse 36, very famous. We all know this. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. In verse 33 in the same chapter, the Pharisees are talking and they're like, well, we've never been slaves. We've never been in bondage. And Jesus is probably thinking, you, you mean Egypt and all the other times you've been in bondage? Jesus is saying, I'm not talking about the freedom that they fake to have. I'm talking about true freedom, real freedom, the freedom that's gonna change your life the freedom that's going to change your eternity. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. So he's given us freedom, but what did he give me freedom from? I want to know what he gave me freedom from, not just that he gave me freedom. Hebrews chapter 9, and again, we're going to be going through a lot of verses today, so we're going to be going pretty quick here. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. Let's look at verse 11 again, and it's going to tell us what we've been freed from. We have been freed from bondage. If you didn't know, if you live on this planet, Satan owns this planet. We're his prisoners. God has given us freedom from that bondage. Christ, so verse 11, so Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. He's wanting to make sure right now, off the bat, we know this isn't about you. You're not involved in this. In our vernacular, we'd say, this is out of this world, okay? This isn't something that human beings could do. Only God could do. Continuing in verse 12, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. 
Now, I love the wiggle room here. There is none. Jesus is telling us with extreme confidence, he entered the most holy place once, not daily, not yearly, not any time other than once. And for how long? All time. His sacrifice is forever. Not for a week, not for a month, just forever. And secured our redemption forever. Once, all time, forever. I think he's trying to give us, make sure we understand the point. Our freedom from bondage is through him. It was the blood of Christ that gives us this freedom, that gives us freedom from the bondage of Satan. Now, the animal sacrifices that he's talking about, they could give us a temporary cover, covering from sin. But only the sacrifice of God could give us eternal freedom, could cover our sins eternally. Point number two, things that we're free from. We are free from the guilt of sin. Verses 13 and 14, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurities. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. These verses explain the limited effectiveness of animal sacrifices. It could purify us to go into the temple, but that was it. It had, could not purify our conscience. It could not purify our sinful deeds. Only the true sacrifice from Jesus can that happen. Jesus purifies us, gives us freedom from the guilt that we deserve. So we've been freed, we've given freedom from bondage, we're free from the guilt of sin. And number three in verse 14, we are free to serve a living God. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Now don't miss this. God gives us freedom from bondage. He, then he gives us freedom from guilt of sin. And then that, that puts us in a place where we can best worship and serve God. If we don't have freedom from bondage, if we aren't free from the guilt of sin, we can't worship God. We can't serve God. The freedom that God gives us allows us to worship God. Our founding fathers understood this connection between government and God very clearly. They understood that faith and freedom were connected. Not only was it necessary, it was absolutely indispensable. The Declaration of Independence, actually the preamble, listen carefully to see how the connection between God and freedom matches here. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident means, why are we even saying this? It's obvious. We don't even need to write it down, but they did anyway. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, given by their creator, with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the suit, pursuit of happiness. The key word here is, un, is unalienable. I'm getting tongue-tied. It means it's possible to take away and it's impossible to give up. They understood that our rights and our freedom were endowed by God. They weren't given to us by government. They were given to us by God. And they also understood that it was the key to maintain this freedom is to put our trust in God. Thomas Jefferson, quote from him, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these, these liberties are a gift of God? He had no doubt our freedom is a gift of God. John Adams, this is my favorite quote from all the things that I've studied, our constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It wasn't made for anybody else other than moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government 
of any other. So in other words, if you're not going to be a moral country, if you're not going to have values, you're not going to follow me, you're going to fail. This government that we set up, this freedom that we set up will only work if you understand those principles. Dwight D. Eisenhower, not a founder, but this quote was so good I couldn't resist. It says, without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. The most basic expression of Americanism is recognizing God as our supreme being. That's what makes America, America. So what our founders said, that's what I believe. These great leaders understood that. They understood that our real freedom is given to us by God. Principle number two. Real freedom is governed by love. In other words, how is my freedom, the freedom that I have, how is it governed by love? How is my behavior governed by love? How are my words governed by love? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, we'll continue in those verses. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. But don't use your freedoms to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Now, why did he start out by saying, don't use your freedoms for sinful, for sinful pleasure, sinful nature? Because he knows us. He knows what we're like when we're alone. We know what we watch on TV when we're alone. We know how we act when we think nobody's watching. And God doesn't want us to act like that. He doesn't want us to be selfish. He wants us to use our freedom to serve one another, to love one another. That's what also our founding fathers wanted. Let's look at this a little deeper. Philippians chapter 2. If you'd turn with me, Philippians chapter 2. Paul's going to give us a very clear view of what this will look like. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, these are four rhetorical questions that Paul is asking. He's not saying, really asking you these. These are things that you should already know. He's saying, Christian, I, I know you know these things. And if you don't know these things today, I'm talking to us. If we don't know these, we better find out. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, we need to know that, yes, that there is consolation in Christ. There is comfort and love. There is fellowship in the Spirit. There is affection and there is mercy. Paul is going to show us in verse 2 what that's going to look like. Verse 2 goes on and says, Fulfill my joy being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, a lot of people say being like-minded, they think, well, that means we all have to agree. No, we don't. That's not what God is asking us to do at all. He's asking us to believe in the same moral values, to believe the same morality, have the same value system. In today's world, I, I laugh, there's my truth and your truth. We can all, each have our own truths. Well, if we're Christians, that's not possible. First of all, truth is a person, and that truth is Jesus Christ. But there's one truth. There's not my truth. There's no such thing as my truth. So what is this going to look like? Being like-minded, having the same love, having the same love for each other, the kind of love that he's going to describe where we look out for one another, where we're more concerned about you than we are for ourselves. Being of one accord, of one mind. Again, not agreeing, one purpose. What's the purpose that we have? Why are we here? What's our purpose as a church? To lift up Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. That's what this looks like. Then in verse 3, he's going to give us the steps on how to create that. 
Verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. How are we going to do that? What are we going to do to get to this level of love? Take out selfish ambition. Take out conceit. And when we look at each other, we need to not look at each other through our eyes. We need to look at each other as Jesus sees us. When Jesus sees somebody, he doesn't see them as we are. He sees them as who they can be. When he sees you, he sees you as you can be, not as what you are right now. I have faults. I have failures. You don't need to point them out. I know they're already there. But when you see me, try to see me through Jesus' eyes. When I see you, I want to try to see you through Jesus' eyes. That's what Paul is telling us to do. In verse 4, let each of you look out not only for our own interest, but also for the interest of others. So again, taking care of one another. This is what it means to be governed by love. I'm going to look out for you. You're going to look out for me. I'm going to thank the best of you. You're going to thank the best of me. Here's a problem. When we combine freedoms without responsibility, things go horribly wrong. When our founders wrote the Bill of Rights, they assumed personal morality and personal responsibility. We don't have that anymore. What, what we have right now is about me. It's about my rights, what I can get away with, what I can do. What this is allowing us to do, when we separate freedoms from responsibility, it allows me to be as selfish as I possibly can be. Who do you think wants us to be like that? I don't think that's what God wants to be like. Right now in our country, many care more about themselves than anybody else. This is my right. I don't care what it does to you. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my right. This is our right. But my rights impact me. My rights impact you, my community, my school, my neighborhood, my coworkers. We're not in a vacuum. My freedom affects everybody around me. Am I going to use it for God's glory? Am I going to use my freedom for the benefit of others? Or am I going to just use it for myself? This is what it means to have our freedom governed by love. I need to leverage my freedom for the benefit of others. If you want to... Um, scare your coworkers to death, go in Monday morning, Monday's a holiday, go in Tuesday morning to work, and go in and say, how can I help? They're going to look at you funny. and say, oh, oh, we don't do that around here. You help yourself, I help myself, and I might help myself to what you help yourself to, but we do not help each other around here. That's what it's like in this world. What if it wasn't? What if I went in to my home and I made sure my wife was sitting down? And I said, honey, how can I help? She's going to say, who are you? Who stole my husband's body? Teenage kids, you want to control your parents? Here's the best way to do it. Walk into the kitchen when mom's making something, go in there and say, mom, how can I help? Pick her up off the ground and then help. Dad, how can I help? How can I serve you? How can I be of service to you? That's what it means to be governed by love. Now I'm going to bring this a little closer to home. Can you imagine what Collegedale Community Church would look like if our members came to the leaders of the church and said, how can I help? Where can I serve? That rarely happens. And when I ask people, what do you do in the church? What's your position? They say, well, I don't have one. I'm like, well, why not? Well, no one's ever asked me to. 
or I don't know what needs to be done. I'm gonna give you a clue. There's almost 1,800 members in our church now. We don't know all of you. We don't know what your skills are. Ask. Is that fair? Ask. Where can I be? Where can I serve? Where can you use me? What needs to be done? I guarantee you, we'll tell you. We have lots to do. Look at the weeds. It's killing me. But there's so many things in this church that needs to be done. And we're here to serve one another. We're family. I'm going to go on a little tangent here. This is one of the things that scares me about College Dell. It's because we have so many churches, they become consumer churches. Everybody comes, consumes, and then they go home. That's not my church. That's the place I go to on Sabbath. This is our home. This is your home church. This is where you belong. We're family. Most people look, oh, so-and-so's preaching at the university church. Let's go there this week. And then the next week, hey, somebody, I'm not saying it's not bad to occasionally go somewhere else, but are you a consumer of church or is this your church? I'll stop. Now I'm in trouble for two things. Here's what our founding fathers had to say about serving and loving others. Here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe, that he governs it by his providence, that he ought to be worshiped, that the most acceptable service we render to him is in doing good to, other, to his other children. Benjamin Franklin. The best way we can worship God is by being kind to others. That's the best way we can serve God. Our founding father said that. One of them. John Adams. I believe John Adams was dreaming when he wrote this. <laughs> Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Every member would be obligated in conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity towards his fellow men, and to piety, love, and reverence towards Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? Can you imagine what it would be like if that's what we were? Do you know that if we acted like God wanted us to act, we wouldn't need laws? There would not be a need for any law. Love will solve every problem we have a law for. Laws don't motivate you to do something. They punish you when you do something wrong. They can't make you be nice. You know, they, we can have a speed limit, and that makes you not drive too fast, but we're humans. We're going to say, okay, how fast can I drive to not get pulled over? Okay, how fast can I drive to get pulled over but not get a ticket? Okay, how fast can I drive, I get pulled over, get a ticket, but not go to jail? How fast can I drive, okay, I'll get pulled over, I'll get a ticket, they won't go to jail, and I won't lose my license. That's what law does. Love doesn't do that. Law is powerless in the world of God. Love is the supreme power. So far, principle number one, freedom is given by God. Principle number two, real freedom is governed by love. And principle number three, real freedom is guided by wisdom. What are the guidelines for my freedom? Can you imagine if you played football and there are no sidelines? There are no end zones? If I wanted to run that way, I could just run forever. That wouldn't be a very fun game. If I played baseball, no matter where I hit the ball, it's in play. If I didn't have foul lines, how do I know if it's out of bounds? That's what some people want with freedom. They want no lines. Whatever I want to do, that's not biblical. God wants us to give us guidelines. And that guideline is how to use our freedom to give us wisdom so that we can know how to use this freedom. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5, continuing in these three verses that we're looking at today. Verse 14 says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one, in one word, in the statement, Love your neighbor as yourself. I have to apologize, I'm stuttering. My allergies are killing me. I don't know if anybody else is suffering from allergies. I didn't know you could have this much liquid inside your head. But anyway, bear with me. So I apologize. Paul is telling us in this verse that we need to use wisdom in how we use our freedoms. We need wisdom to use our freedoms correctly. He made it very, very simple. I'm sure he was thinking of me. I'm going to make this really simple so even Jim can understand. He summed it up into one word. Love. The whole law, now this is going to be hard for some of us in here, especially in this faith community. The whole law can be summed up with one word. Love. Love takes the place of every law God has ever given. I believe that. It's a hard statement, especially in this faith community. I said it before, but if we had love the way God wants us to love each other, we wouldn't have need for laws. We would solve every problem on this planet. We would go around and we would learn, we'd use that love and use that wisdom to exercise that, to come up with the idea of what's best for other people. Not what is best for me. What is best for you? How can I serve you? If I do this, how is it going to affect you? Now, if I truly love you, I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to lie about you. I'm not going to envy you. I'm not even going to try to hurt you. Now, I want to read a statement. It says, love in the heart is God's substitute for law in the head. Love in the heart is God's substitute for law in the head. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of Christians who have a lot of knowledge in their head. And they have very little love in their heart. I don't want to be one of them. And it's a struggle for every one of us. We love doctrine. We love Bible knowledge. Do you know why we love doctrine? Because we can control that. I can control if I'm a vegetarian or not. I can control what day I go to church on. I can control all these things. What I can't control is my character. I can't be kind to you. I just can't. It takes a miracle. I can't be loving. It takes a miracle. That's why I love law so much more than love, because I can't control love. Love in the heart is God's substitute for law in the head. We need to get that information into our hearts so that we can love one another. I wonder what it would be if we woke up every morning and we said, I'm going to treat my girlfriend like I want some boy to treat my sister. I'm going to treat my wife like, one, like I want one day for my daughter's husband to treat her. I'm going to treat my husband like I want some young lady to treat my son someday. I'm going to treat people at work the way I wish my former boss treated me. Paul is telling us that the whole law is summed up in one word, love. And God is telling us to use it in wisdom. So, we've been given freedom by God. He's asked to govern it with love, and he's asked us to be guided by wisdom. That's hard to do. But God tells us how to do that. How do I use wisdom to guide my freedom? Turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we're going to go through this pretty quick. Uh, we're only going to read one verse here. Verse 17 says, But the wisdom that comes from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. This wisdom is first pure. This reference is not to sexual purity. It's about sinful attitudes, our motives. This wisdom is peaceable. This word is not the word that we think of 
when we think of peaceable. It's not a peacemaker. It's not somebody that's, um, you know, puts their arm around you and says, it's okay. This word is almost exclusively used when it's describing the character of God. This is a gentle, kind, peaceful that we really don't understand. This wisdom is gentle. This means to know it is wrong to apply the strict letter of the law, even though we could. This wisdom is willing to yield, not be stubborn. This wisdom is full of mercy. It doesn't judge others strictly on the basis of the law, but how we want to be treated. This wisdom is full of good fruit. This wisdom doesn't just talk about it. It doesn't read about it. It actually does it. This wisdom is without partiality. It doesn't judge. It doesn't look for faults in others. We love this one. we like, hey, did you hear what so-and-so did? Hey, can you believe this person did that? We gotta stop doing that. And this wisdom is what, without hypocrisy, without pretending to be what it is not. And I learned this lesson the hard way when I moved down south. Southerners, when I moved down here, I heard the expression, bless your heart. I thought that was a nice thing to say. I have been told that that can mean two possible things. And I can only tell you one of those things. Because the other one is not appropriate for church. The one that I can share is, bless your heart, is pretty much like me going up and tapping you on the head and say, oh, bless your pointy little head. I can't believe you're so S-T-U-P-I-D. I can't say that word. When Shelby was born, my wife came up to me and she said, okay, you can't say this word, this word, this word, this word, and this word. And I'm like, that's 90% of my vocabulary. What am I going to say? So then I started spelling things as best I could. And then finally, Natalie's like, Jim, Shelby can spell. So I couldn't say anything. So there was a period for five or six years, I didn't even speak. No words I could use. So when Southerners come up to you and say, bless your heart, they don't mean it nice. They're being hypocritical. Just saying. Our founding fathers understood this principle. George Washington says, observe good faith and justice towards all nation. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Do you see the riots going on in our country? We're accusing police of being the bad guys when they're trying to protect us. Not trying to get too political. Benjamin Rush said, The gospel of Jesus Christ prescribes the wisest rule for just conduct in every situation of life. Happy they are who, enable, who are enabled to obey them in all situations. John Adams says, Always stand on principle, even if you stand alone. Every parent will understand what I'm saying if you have a seventh and eighth grader. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else has one. I'm the only kid at school who doesn't have one. First of all, it's not true. And second of all, it's okay to be the only one that's doing the right thing. Okay? We have to stand strong as parents. We need to get together and unite because they're going to wear us down. My wife is still mad at me that I gave a cell phone to my daughter in the ninth grade. And she was the only one in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade who didn't have a cell phone. I don't believe that for a second. God is asking us to use our wisdom wisely. Freedom is dangerous. Freedom is scary. Freedom is uncomfortable. I have the freedom to say whatever I want. Now, unfortunately, I'll give you an example. We've abused that freedom to, now I can't go into a movie theater and yell fire. We've had to make a law because I've abused my freedom. But I can say really mean, nasty things to you if it's not guided by wisdom. God gave freedom to Adam and Eve, and they abused it. We've been given freedom, and God is asking us to use it wisely. Now, 2,000 years ago, Paul had a message for our 21st century church. He's saying, if you don't get this right, what we've been talking about, if you don't get this right, If you don't understand that freedom comes from God, if you don't understand that freedom is governed by love, if you don't understand that freedom is guided by wisdom, you're going to fail. Don't get this wrong. 
Because if you do, you're going to become like dogs and you're going to devour and destroy one another. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. It's the last verse in this section that we're going to look at. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. If we don't love one another, if we don't do what's best for one another, if we don't esteem one another, if we don't care for one another, we will become like dogs, biting and devouring one another. And eventually, we will destroy each other. And unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong, but unfortunately, I think that's where our country has gone. That's the road our country has gone down. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think we can ever come back. In one way, that's good news. In one way, that's bad news. Bad news is morality's out the window. Good news is, can it get much worse before Jesus comes back? But all the signs, I'm not a doomsdayer, but all the signs are there. We don't want to be like dogs. We don't want to bite one another. We don't want to devour one another. John Adams sent us a message. John Adams looked into the future and he sees me and he sees you and he writes us a letter. He starts off, prosperity. That's the future. These are people he will never meet, people he will never see. He's saying, future Americans, you will never know how much it costs this present, present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. John Adams. John Adams is writing that to us today. We will never know the cost to gain that freedom. Isaiah also wrote us a note. Isaiah was looking into the future. He's looking at future generations. These are people that he's never going to see, that he's never going to meet. He's saying, hey, future Christians. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. We must never forget what it costs our freedom. Whether it's in this country, what our founding fathers did, we must never forget the cost to them for our freedom, and we should never forget the cost of what it cost Jesus to give us true freedom. If any of you in here today would like to embrace that freedom, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this country. Thank you the freedoms that we enjoy. Thank you that we can be here. We don't need a government permit. We can just openly praise and worship you. And we thank you for that. But Lord, we want to use our freedoms to give you glory. We want our freedoms to be governed by love. We want our freedoms to be guided by your wisdom. Help us to that end. In your holy name we pray. Amen.